The spirit of Lindau is the openness of the discussion and the passion for science that inspires and connects beyond the day. For 60 years, very unusual scientific meetings have been held in a small town on Lake Constance in Germany. These days, large numbers of Nobel Prize winners come to the meetings in Lindau. The universe starts with this period we call inflation. They come to speculate, to theorize, to argue, and above all, to meet the future generation. The spirit of Lindau is the combination of scientific excellence, deep passion for science, curiosity, and the insight that science does not provide final answers. I mean, some scientists, I think, are not quite as doubtful as they ought to be. You know, my, my friend François Jacob once said, it's not science that is dangerous, it's ignorance. After the Second World War, the Germans had been isolated for quite some time. So two doctors here in Lindau, in this medieval town, which is behind me, they decided they wanted to invite some Nobel laureates in physiology or medicine to come here and to tell them what had happened during the war. This was our father, Dr. Franz Karl Hein. This was Professor Parade. And this is Count Leonard Bernadotte. My father was in cancer research until 1935 at the University of Munich. In 1935, his chef, Professor Döderlein, retired. His successor was a staunch Nazi, and my father, who was, had been a staunch anti-Nazi, of course refused to become a member of the party, and upon which he was thrown out of the University of Munich. Dr. Hein moved his family to Lindau, where he was able to set up in private practice, and after the war he became active in local politics. Our father was a member of the city council in 1948-49 and persuaded the city to accept such a scientific meeting, which by that time the idea had escalated to invite Nobel laureates, the best of the best. It took him a little while to persuade the city council, but the Lord Mayor, Geheimrat Dr. Frisch, supported him. There was a tremendous atmosphere of wanting to break out of the isolation that had been experienced and wanting to move forward and wanting to make connections again. Die Gesellschaft war froh, wieder frei zu sein, rauszukommen, andere Menschen, andere Menschen aus anderen Ländern kennenzulernen. Das war damals eine ganz besondere Zeit. Man hatte eigentlich nur Optimismus, keinen Pessimismus. Man guckte nur, schaute nur vorwärts. They approached the Count Leonard Bernadotte from the Swedish royal family, and together they actually managed to get some money to get the town to, to help them, and in 1951 there was the first meeting. Having been born in 1945, I was barely, not even quite six years old, so of course I had to come along as the little girl. I have some very, very special memories of these times as I grew up with this. And then this brilliant idea came up. We should invite young people, students, young researchers. And even though the idea may not have emanated with Count Leonard Bernadotte, he was the one who actually made it happen. He organized the 1954 meeting, which was the first one where really hundreds of students were present. The students met many scientists who'd fled from Germany during the war and who'd only returned because of the Lindau meetings. Indeed, for some of these scientists, Lindau became a place for reconciliation between estranged friends and former colleagues. In some cases it was possible, and in some cases, as for example, Einstein, who never came back to Germany, and in his correspondence berated Max Born for having returned, and Max Born mentions in one of his letters one of the positive experiences was uh, the meeting in Lindau. Max Born came back after the war and he's here in Lindau together with his old student Werner Heisenberg who stayed here and who tried to develop a German atomic bomb. 
and they are talking peacefully with each other. There was an atmosphere that was very special here that allowed for not only a scientific meeting but also for human encounters. For many years the Lindau meetings were German-speaking and most of those who came were from the countries around the lake, Germany, Austria and Switzerland. It's amazing for me even to tell you that I came here first 49 years ago when I had just finished my studies of chemistry in Graz. I was sponsored by some government agency whose name I forgot. I stayed in a little room and I met for the first time some of the great names I had only heard about or read about in books. And I actually drank a glass of beer with me, shook hands with me and discussed the science with me. I'll never forget this experience. I was lucky in meeting some very modest but very influential Nobel laureates. One was Staudinger, who was a giant in the field of big molecules such as nylon, which was fairly new in those days. And Hans Krebs, who was a pioneer of metabolism, a field I later worked in myself. And these people simply said very important things as asides. They were not pompous, they were not arrogant, they were extremely modest. The meetings themselves were always held on Lindau, but soon the grand closing ceremony was staged on Count Leonard Bernadotte's private island of Mainau and near his family home. The present chairman of the meetings, Wolfgang Schurer, describes the next much more significant development. Count Leonard was a man fascinated to reach out to the next generation. And uh, this is how we met and how we forged a bond, if you wish. When I met him, he was already quite an elderly gentleman. And he was always in a very, very warm spirit. And the best thing I recall is to see the radiance of his smile when we started reaching out internationally. When the laureates said, we are very, very happy that this is now turning into a very international meeting. I think that the internationality of this meeting is one of its greatest attributes and it grew to enormous proportion in this, you know, 70 different countries. It's really unbelievable. More than, than representatives at the UN that are sitting at one day in the General Assembly. The Bernadotte family continues to support the meetings through Count Leonard's daughter, Countess Bettina. Countess Bettina is combining the best of both of her parents. The independence of thought and the vision of her father and the warmth of him and the perseverance of her mother. I certainly did not expect to be the president of the Lindau Nobel meetings when I was a child. But it was from the beginning on very interesting to meet the laureates. We used to be there whenever possible as children and used to sit there during lunch pouring water from one glass to another through small tubes and <laughs> trying uh, the experiments you can do at a lunch table. It was very nice to grow into that meeting and to see the dialogue between these young people and the laureates. And uh, it felt, in the end, quite natural that this should happen, that I should take over the presidency from my mother. I know of no other event where so many people give so freely of their time, so many people come together with so much enthusiasm, and not least, so many donors, commercial organizations, foundations, put so much money into it and expect nothing whatsoever in return. Well, what's quite interesting is that when I came to Lindau first, which was about four or five years ago, I hadn't even known that my father had been here at that time 45 years before that. I think this is one of the very few events that we've ever been uh, to together where you actually have industry and science meet at this level. I think it probably wouldn't hurt to underline what Count Leonard's dream was. What do you, how would you put it? 
I think his dream was to provide a place for an intergenerational dialogue and without regard to be it nationalism and nationality, uh, be it religion, be it gender, he wanted to have one place where for one week the world could meet the world of science. To listen to the lectures, even for me, of these wonderful discoveries and how they started simply. The beginning was always very simple. Look at this Shimamura that was diving in the waters in the night and because of the UV found this jellyfish that is shining. And now everybody in the audience yesterday raised their hand to say, yes, we do use GFP. It started from nothing, from an observation of somebody. Hearing people uh, like John Mather talk about the future of the cosmos or um, David Gross talk about, you know, is space-time quantized and this is going to explain the unification of force. I mean, this is just such romantic, wonderful stuff. I love it. There was an amazing story of Charlie Towns, who was developing the Maser. When he was doing this, uh, two Nobel Prize winners uh, came in and told him, you, it won't work, um, uh, you know it won't work, you're using up the departmental money. And he said, basically, I was already an associate professor, so I knew they couldn't fire me. And I sort of went on and did it. And, uh, of course, we have everything around us, lasers, masers, and things of this nature. So the advice from that is don't listen to Nobel Prize winners. <laughs> <laughs> I think these people at this conference are the movers and shakers of the next few decades. These are key people all from all over the world. And I want them to understand that one of the reasons that there's a conflict in a lot of people's minds, in the public's minds with regard to science, is that it's the construct that human beings have developed to determine what is true, what could be true, and what might be true. And that is seen, I think, by many as dangerous for people who want to control society on the basis of dogma. I think there's no question that the beauty of Lindau, with its wonderful lakeside setting, is an inspiration for everybody. And it is part of the reason why people unwind here and enter into this spirit of informality, which I think is so crucial. You have outstanding people, and you have keen, capable young scientists. And they all talk to each other. They bump into each other, and they all have tremendous pleasure from talking about uh, the science and what it is to be a scientist. This experience has been fantastic. The meeting is unlike any other I've been to. And it's just because of the interactions between the students and the laureates, there's no intermediate. The, the purpose of the meeting is to bring together students from different countries and have them interact with laureates and with each other. And that's exactly what, what happened. I've been blown away by the meeting. He likes me because I'm brilliant, you know, charming and enormously modest. <laughs> he likes about me. I remember here at Lindau, once a student told me, you know what's wrong with scientists? You're never sure of anything. You ask them to say, yes, well, we think that. And uh, she said, that, that's one of the weaknesses of science. And I told him, this is one of the grandeurs of science. This idea that you might be wrong. You know, Einstein said it very well when he said, no experiment will ever prove that I'm correct, but one experiment at any time can prove that I'm wrong. And if everybody had this feeling of, of the possibility that they might be wrong, it would be the end of bigotry, you know, of fanaticism. In those days, science was considered to be the only hope for the future. And I must admit, I still see it as the only hope. For almost 50 years later, even more so now than in those days. And of course, to see the students coming out of the discussions with the Nobel laureates, you know, with their eyes shining, and I think it's really like Walt Disney. There is really those eyes that are like stars, and pop, and they come out, and it's a, it's a marvelous experience. So we're in this beautiful place, this beautiful setting, and a lot of people think that science is the antithesis of those sorts of things, of this natural beauty, and it's actually the opposite. Science is the substance of this beauty, and I, I think that's fabulous. 
How many times in a lifetime of a student does he have an opportunity to meet 20, 30, 40, 50 Nobel laureates and just to knock on their doors, to bump into them in the dining room, to sit with them over dinner, and, and to ask them whatever is on their heart. I mean, this was my dream as a kid. And here, all of a sudden, you can see that the Lindau Foundation can make this dream true.